it's pretty easy to accumulate stuff and it's even easier to accumulate stuff that you don't really need. So it's a tough question to ask yourself. Am I being a clutterbug? Am I being a hoarder? I actually went to meet somebody on from Craigslist over this. I bought fit something like 14 or 15 coffee cans full of assorted nuts, bolts, and hardware, and I spent two days organizing them. You probably just reacted with some sort of smile-like gesture that was something like, better you than me, buddy. <laughs> but it's not entirely irrational. Some of these things, these little parts, they get ridiculously expensive when you have to keep buying them in packs of four or six or five, I've noticed as a trend. Why on would you want a five pack of something? That doesn't make sense. But it's more than just that. It's also about the inconvenience of having to run to the store. So for the longest time, I've just had this as my selection and it just keeps growing, but it's still not enough. Hey, as a cool aside, kind of like a trophy for doing this, look what I got. We used magnets to sort through it. And while the trouble that I went through to get this might have been pretty horrible, you have to admit that's a pretty cool payoff. Half of this also came with it, but I had already had, like I said, about half of this when I started. So $50, two hours and two days of not so pleasant labor later, I have this catastrophe. And how do I convert this into something that isn't just entirely irrational? Okay, so I have this kind of maxim that dictates my behavior here. This actually is kind of a cliche that you already know you just might have trouble implementing if you're anything like me, which is that in your shop, if you don't have a place for something, then it shouldn't be there. Like with these pliers, these particular pliers, they each have their own seat and they get used so they earn a right to be there and I never have trouble finding them. Similar is the case for all these. But if you have some coffee can somewhere filled with a bunch of screwdrivers, you're never going to use those. So the moral of the story is this, everything has to have a place and so I'm going to dedicate a certain amount of space to having a certain amount of nuts and bolts and whatever spills over beyond that place that I'm willing to dedicate, I'll get rid of. And so what I'm working on here is a little Lazy Susan sort of thing, a thing that rotates. And I want to have three shelves with five coffee cans each and whatever doesn't fit in that is out of here. Some of them are oddities which really made this fun in a way. Do you know what this is? It's for a bottle cap, a bottle cap remover. How about this? This is the screwing to a car to tow it out. You probably have some one somewhere along with so much oversized nuts that I can't use them. Oh, that's, yeah, it's a common problem I know, guys, shut up. And then of course, bolt with completely destroyed threads. Hey, it's a mixed bag. Lags are a dollar something a piece, so a nice can full of those is well worth the money. Okay, enough yapping. So anywho, I'll show you what I have going on here and hopefully I can make it work. It cost me virtually nothing, it's just made from scrap. Let's see if we, I can pull this off. Let's start at the very bottom. Cast iron base. It came off of my old gas grill. It kept rusting outside and I came up with something better. There's a video for it, but that is not relevant right now. I just bolted this sandwich of three quarter plywood to it with some all thread and nuts. On the very bottom layer, there's some of this stuff, which is high density plastic, polyethylene. You can see it down there at the bottom. And the reason for that is because 
the PVC pipe, which will make the main support beam, will ride on that and rub on it. It's just a friction bearing. Note that I'm using engine 3 8 inside diameter PVC and my closest hole saw cuts something that's just a little bit bigger. So in order to make holes that are a little more precise, you would step down to the next smaller hole saw and then use a router with a straight bit to open the hole a little bit until you get a perfect fit. It's much easier than you think, I'll explain in a little bit. And so this entire block is really loose fitting. And I've made a tight fitting block for the top just to help hold the pipe from wiggling too much. This will also be the surface upon which the first shelf of this carousel rests. So all of the weight from the first five coffee cans will be directly on this block. Moving upwards, it will be different. Here's a really helpful little trick to reattach two pieces of wood that have already been screwed together. You leave a few of the screw tips just sticking out a little tiny bit and then kind of snap them into the screw holes. Then you back them back out and then put them in the whole way. This will be the first shelf. This will keep it from spinning out of place. And this pin up here, if it's still in frame for you, will support the second shelf. So the second shelf will have its weight directly on this pole and thus transferred all the way down to the plastic. This one will spin independently of this. In total, there are three circles one of which is done, and all three of which are 17 inch diameter. The bottom two circles are the exact same part, but the top circle I'll have to do a little bit differently to get it to stay on. If you use the diagonals trick on a piece that isn't a square, then you'll end up with two useless scraps so we'll use a different trick, a different compass trick on this side to find where we should start. Don't skip this step. This compass is set to the diameter of this pipe as close as I can possibly get it. And I'm going to drill out the bulk of this and then fine tune the circle with a router. There's a few tricks to this trick. In the router I've put a straight bit, and it's my oldest straight bit. Why? If I want to follow something that closely without the router digging into the side and making some ripple wave shape that I don't want, then it helps to a little bit to have a dull bit. But there's another half to this trick. Traditionally when you route something thick like this, you know, more than let's say 3 eighths of an inch, you want to take it in two passes, so normally I would go halfway through, do the circle, then go the whole way and take the rest. But in this case, instead, I'm going to take the entire depth all at once. With the combination of a slightly dull bit, will make it so that I have lots of control as I approach this really tight curve. As you can clearly tell, it's easy to get extremely precise cuts this way, even while I'm reaching over top of the camera. It might feel a little bit like cheating to you because it's unconventional, but don't let it. Whatever it takes to get results. For this top one, I'm doing it the old fashioned way because I'm not going the whole way through. It's still kind of the same thing because the deeper you go, the closer you can get to the edge because there's more resistance. 
It's just easing up to the line. Same technique in a way. Next up, let's add some supports here and here by just making some donut shaped things. That's right, there's an adjustable spotlight made from plywood hanging from my ceiling. <laughs> there's a link at the end of this video. The spacing here between the shelves is 11 inches, and that leaves something like 5 inches for hand room. Next I'll secure these things to their respective shelves, and that will give the whole depth enough bite so that these don't tip over. If it's not sturdy enough, I could always add another one later, but I think this one will be good enough. And so right here at the mark, there'll be a pin that supports all of this from pushing down over the pole. I want to drill perfectly through the middle of this pipe. And so a jig like this is easy enough to use. It's mounted on my Swiss cheese block. And all I have to do to set it up is make sure the travel goes through without hitting the jig. But it, when it's all the way up, it still leaves me room to place my pipe. And I can just stick it here with some clamps. One side is clamped, and so the jig can still rotate for the moment. Align the drill bit with the center, and clamp this side. It's sound reasoning that this should hold a lot of weight. After thinking about it, I decided to give the top layer two of those donuts, and that's about it. Hey, I have nothing better to do tonight. Let's find out how much volume this pipe has. Do you want to use math or sand? Okay, we'll use sand this time. But the math is pi r squared h, where h is the height of the tube. Why are we doing this? Uh, let's leave a little surprise. Way less than you think. And intuitions about such things can be terribly inaccurate, which is exactly why I'm doing this. Or why I would use the math. Now we know how much concrete mix to use. I totally would have guessed more. It doesn't take too much concrete but we don't want the aggregate to be too large. Into it, I'm also going to add a little bit of additional Portland cement and another product that's just high in fiberglass. Of course, those additions are not necessary, but then again, none of this would be necessary if I would have just used a metal pole. <laughs> Everything has been removed except for the middle shelf. I'm going to leave it on during the process just so that I don't have to take those pins out. Later, after the concrete has cured and become really hard inside, I could tap these out, but for the moment, let's just leave it in place.
one side of the pipe can be corked with a piece of wood and it just has some electrical tape on it. Also, I'm using a zinc plated quarter inch threaded rod as my rebar. This will be permanent, but this will not. This is just an insurance policy. But I do want excess moisture to be able to drip out. This has been mixed a touch on the wet side, and let me show you why. I'm so glad I used the garbage bag. Later, I'll cut the excess all thread away, but it was convenient to leave it long so that I could use it to mix with. That's it for now. Everything went as planned, and it's dripping a little bit, but not too much. And so now it just needs to enjoy 48 hours of peace, don't we all? It has now been a few days, and it's, well, as hard as a rock. The most obvious question might be, will it work without the concrete? And the answer is, kind of. I have some footage of it. But the addition of the concrete has made it considerably stronger. We can test it out for the moment, but its permanent home will be behind that door in the corner because I have to treat it like an open container since I'm always battling dust in here. A note on its design. Sometimes I get these ideas and they're not the best way to do things, but that doesn't matter. I follow it because that's what I want. Of course, I'm totally aware that there are way more efficient ways to go about solving this problem. But that really wouldn't be watch worth watching, would it? The whole point is to try to be unconventional in a way that has lateral application to maybe some other ideas. So in that spirit of thinking, I hope you got something out of this. The main idea was to treat this bottom row like it's a foundation. It kind of places a really sturdy support for the rest of it. Totally not the best way to do it. But it wouldn't be interesting if it were the best way to do it, would it? <laughs> One last mistake of mine that you can learn from here. This wobble, it's not a threat to it, and it's not deflection. You might think it's the pipe bending, but it's actually down here. Remember how this top circle fits the pipe tightly? The rest of them are loose. If I were to build this again, I would make this bottom piece of plywood right here have a tight fit just like that. And then it would act as a bearing that hugs it here and here. Okay, see you next time. Before you bolt, 
don't think I'm nuts for doing this, because without this thing, I'd be screwed.